Good evening. How are you all doing? Good. It's nice to be part of this uh, empath uh, conference. As I was thinking of just about the term, you know, we, uh, we tend to use words to differentiate between what's normal. And so by normal, I mean just uh, not healthy, but what's uh, normal. But for example, we use the word nonviolence. And we don't use the word peaceful. You know, it's because we live in a violent world, so it's nonviolence. And I think we use the word empath. And what's, what's the dominant situation going on in the world? And I think it would be numbing. I think we live in a world where we have to numb ourselves. Or we don't have to, but there's a predominant sense of numbing. And what I'll be speaking about today is just about what this uh, empathic revolution is about. You know, I, I think that um, I remember growing up as a boy, you were told, you know, not to cry, not to have your feelings, and, you know, the awful term, uh, buck up, buttercup, have you heard that one? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, while I understand why uh, a parent might want a child to, to learn that, I think that it's also good to have a conference like today where we can uh, meet together as a group and we can talk about how actually sensitivity is healthy and numbing is not healthy. You know, numb, if, if your finger is numbed, it means it's injured in some way. And so this, this sensitivity, I think it's empaths are healthy people. I think the human being in its healthy situation is supposed to be empathic, is supposed to, to feel its uh, surroundings. Um, and for an example from my life, I remember when my mother was ill, I spent a lot of time in meditation. And I was planning a trip to India. I was going to go on an ARE tour. And it was a bit touch and go whether I was going to go on the trip or not. But I uh, remember being in the hospital with my mother and playing a lot of uh, classical Indian music, which actually is to teach you how to be sensitive, Ali Akbar Khan's music. And I ended up, my mother got better, and I was able to go on the trip to India and had a wonderful, uh, sensitive experience there. And I remember when I came back, a friend of mine invited me to a movie. And the movie was, it was I remember it was a John Travolta and, um, uh, Nicolas Cage movie, and they were trying to kill each other throughout the whole movie. And I remember there was such a uh, reaction to what I was seeing. And as I looked around the theater, people were eating popcorn, you know, yawning, and I realized, wow, that that's the, that's the society that is predominant. It's just kind of numbed. And I had had an experience of really working on my sensitivity. and. Uh, and how much in conflict that was with the, uh, with the predominant uh, kind of coping style of the human form right now in, uh, in this world. So I'm going to look at Edgar Cayce's view on this subject. And it's always uh, it's an honor and privilege for me to be part of these conferences and in some ways be a spokesperson for Cayce's view on the topic that's being picked. And it always invites me to look at the Cayce work from a different angle, just to see what, uh, what Mr. Casey and this, this philosophy would have to say about the subject. So we're going to look at the issues of boundaries, sensitivity, and the unseen forces. So this is the quote that's in your, your schedule. For being a sensitive and capable of the interpretations of the emotions of others is not easy. Would you agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just being a feeler isn't easy in this, uh, in this uh, day and age. Now, um, to make the, 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 to get to the points I want to make tonight, I want to just uh, get us on the same page about certain concepts. So when we talk about the new age, I like to define what the new age uh, for me is as a, as a concept. And I think as a, as a collective soul group, we've gotten tired of the franchising of God, the God Inc., that the different religions have the only path 
to God. And I think the wars that have been uh, over God. And this Casey perspective is that God is the God of all people. Now, Edgar Casey, the man, was a devout Christian, but it wasn't like he grew up where there were any other options for religion. He grew up in a small town in Kentucky, and there was a church in that town. There wasn't a synagogue, there wasn't uh, you know, uh, an ashram or anything like that. So he, he grew up in the predominant religion of uh, the people at, at that time. And so as you look at the KC work, it's thought of as being a Christian philosophy. And I think that if you look deeper, I wouldn't say that it's, it's uh, following any particular religion. I think that Edgar Cayce was a devout Christian. He read the Bible so much that the language came through in his King James English, the Bible that he was reading every day. So I think that was his filter. But I do believe if Edgar Cayce had been a Buddhist, that we would know a lot more about Buddha from the reading. So if you go upstairs to the library and you look at the volumes on Christianity, you'll just see how many questions were asked about that subject because that was his particular interest. And as a Christian, well, his friends were predominantly Christians. And so that was what was, uh, what was pursued. But there was a point in Mr. Casey's development when his readings were starting to talk about Lao Tzu and Confucius, even uh, Buddhism and uh, being a, a Mohammedan, which was the word used for Islam in uh, Casey's readings. So he got uh, wondering. He said, well, you know, I wasn't brought up learning about any of these other great teachers of these religions. And he said, question was asked in trance, well, what's the best religion? And the answer came back from the source and said, well, the one that you actually might practice, that would be a good start. And I love that answer. And I think that's what brings us a lot to this work is that it's not about a particular religion. I think the work of Edgar Cayce brings us closer to God, and hopefully that will deepen our faith in whatever religion we have uh, been raised in or resonates uh, most profoundly with ourselves. So I think this is the, uh, what I would call the new age. It's kind of a spiritual revolution. I think that we have grown tired as a soul group, again, of this religious oppression and religious tyranny, and I think we're, uh, in a way, coming out of the closet. We're here. We're spiritual, we're new age, get over it. You know, there's, there's been centuries and centuries of healers and uh, folks that think outside of the box being killed for merely being mystics and spiritual people. And I think that as a collective soul group, once again, we're coming in to, uh, to liberate uh, the human mind of this uh, in the box uh, sort of thinking about God. Now, Edgar Cayce, when he was asked about this new age that was coming in, he was asked to say, well, what are, what are the aspects that the new age will uh, bring forth? And he said that it would be an age of purity, and he said that it would become known as the age of the lily. And, you know, Edgar Cayce would, would make these uh, phrases, and then, let's say, the Akashic Records. Mr. Casey put those words together in a reading when he said how he would access our soul uh, remembrance, our soul record. And if you Google Akashic Records, millions of hits now come up on that word. Many people are using the term without realizing that that was coined by Edgar Casey. Of course, Akasha is not coined by Akasha is a Sanskrit word that means ether. And it's basically how time is recorded and how people like Edgar Casey uh, can access and read that uh, Akasha, which got termed the Akashic Records. But he said that this age would be coming, age would become known as the age of the lily. So keep out, you know, maybe you Google age of the lily today, you might get 10 hits, but I wonder over time if it'll become a common term for this, uh, this new age. Now, uh, the other aspect he said is that we are going to all, as a collective humanity, come into greater and greater uh, ease of access uh, to God or higher forces, whatever word you want to use. So that some of what we're seeing now, like, like when the book Conversation with, uh, Conversations with God came out, there was a part of me that kind of resisted that. But I was thinking, who is this guy that he's thinking he can have a conversation with God? 
And I realized, doesn't that sound kind of old age? You know, <laughs> you know, stone him, how dare he? <laughs> but I realized he wasn't saying that he was the only one that could have a conversation with God. He was, in a way, inviting us all to consider that we might be able to access God. And I think that was really the gift, opening the door for all of us. And I think there's been part of this new age is that more and more of us are becoming open about being psychics or intuitives, just beginning to bring in the higher dimensions of consciousness into expression. And so that, Casey said, is that there's a thinning of the veil, so to speak, between the human consciousness and the divine consciousness. And we're slowly tapping into that. But by the time of the fruition of the new age, that'll become more commonplace. Kind of what we have seen only of the the saints and avatars or the founders of the different religions who were receiving divine inspiration, that'll become more and more part of all of our experience. So it's, it's a bit the thought that the Christ consciousness, that the Christ came first in individuals, and the next coming of the Christ is the collective uh, opening of consciousness. So that the, the, each religion has its avatar, which has opened itself to the Christ consciousness. And I'll define the Christ consciousness, and that we are all now, in the second coming, it's all of our awakening to that, uh, to that consciousness. Now, the third aspect that Casey talked about with this new age is he said, along with the direct communion with God is an increase in our collective consciousness, meaning that we are going to become more and more sensitive to each other in a oneness sort of way. That right now on Earth, it's easy to be separate in our consciousness, meaning we can be having a party in our house while a neighbor is suffering. I remember there was, um, when I first moved here to Virginia Beach, I was living in a house where it was kind of the garage apartment and um, a couple was renting it to me. And I remember I began to have difficulty sleeping. And I'd wake up and sometimes three or four in the morning and I'd look outside and I'd see that the light was on at my neighbor's house. And so, just wondered, well, it's kind of late, I guess we're both up. And that happened over a period of time. And about a month or so later, I found out that the couple were divorcing, were splitting up. And he had left, and she was very, very uh, uh, saddened and, and mourning the loss of their marriage. So I realized that there was some way I was picking up on the energy with what was going on for her. And I think all of us have had that experience where we might have a day or two where we're not feeling quite right. Something doesn't quite resonate. And then we find out later a loved one was struggling or even sometimes it's a, a non-personal experience that's happened somewhere in the world that we, that we pick up the energy on. Uh, actually, Nikolai Tesla wrote about this himself. He saw this growing within his consciousness and he saw it growing in the collective uh, consciousness as well. So what it means though is that between where we are now and where we are when we have a collective consciousness that you could say in a way uh, sleeping or the, the separate consciousness is going to struggle as it moves into the collective because right now most people can sleep fine if there's a tragedy somewhere on the other side of the globe but as we begin to awaken we're if there isn't peace everywhere, there isn't going to peace, be peace within ourselves. So in a way that doesn't sound great, but it's one of the ways that we're becoming unnumbed. You see, when we can all just be separate, there's a, there's a bit of a numbing of the collective consciousness. And as we move more into the collective consciousness, we're going to start tapping in to the, uh, the feelings that are going on, not just with our neighbor, not just with our loved ones, but in a collective sort of way. And if you think of it, that's a wonderful thing to happen to evolve consciousness because now we're going to become personally connected to suffering. So if it's going on somewhere else, it's going on in our consciousness and so we're going to have a personal motivation to alleviate suffering rather than just have it being uh, a cognitive thought. It's going to be a, an emotional reality. Now, I'll talk about this as we go along, but I think that the empaths that are coming in, the highly empathic souls, are the forerunners of this. They're, they're paving the way for this. And I'd have to say they're very, very brave because it's not an easy time to come in as, uh, as empathic. Let's see if I, if I have that. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that later. Now, 
um, in the nature of soul consciousness, that I believe that our creation, that our original state is of oneness. That in the original, uh, if you look at the, the strange story of our creation, it was in the beginning we were with God. And then in the creation or first cause, whatever word, as we were created as souls, we were given individuality. We were given free will, the ability to either stay in the God consciousness or to uh, voyage and experience outside of it. It's a bit the story of the prodigal child. The prodigal child is home, but it also can go out and explore uh, creation. So that's the creation of us as souls. We can be in the oneness or we can be individualized. Now in a meditation, I had a, an experience of it, like a dreamlike experience where I felt I could be one with all of creation and then I could click into my little aspect of it. I could see, it was like I could, I could be, I don't know, a liver cell and then I could experience the whole body. Bump into being a liver cell and being one with the whole body. So I think that's the, the nature of our soul consciousness. But I think what's happened in this little voyage that we've had in coming to Earth, I think what's happened is that there's been a split, meaning that in our original oneness and individuality where we could experience both, in coming into Earth there's become a separation, meaning that we're in a way trapped or stuck in the individual aspect. I mean, we have the individual the aspect which we have free will and we have creative ability, but somehow we've lost or it's more difficult to access the oneness. Do you follow that? Now I think that as above, so below, I oftentimes uh, think about um, like the GPS, you know, the, the um, global positioning system. Does anyone here remember, uh, we used to drive around with these paper things and they was really small. <laughs> I think they were called maps. I don't know what's happened to Rand McNally, but they, every gas station you could buy maps and you'd try to you'd use marker or you know, those, try to get around. But do you remember what that was like? Trying to drive? You know, you might go a mile and it would take you an hour with all the wrong turns you'd make. But you know, you have a GPS, you put it on your phone and you know, the worst that it tells you is recalculating. You know, you just gotta take a right or a left later on than where you are. But I think that that's a symbol of the, the individualized self is driving and the soul self is the satellite which tells where you're going. And so I think it's a symbol of us integrating the individual and the collective view. And I think before there was a GPS, the map was really trying to struggle with the separation from the, uh, from the higher, bless you, from the, uh, from the higher consciousness. Bless you. If it's a third one, I don't know. Maybe I can give you a lozenge or something. So, so this is what I think we're struggling with here. Now, of course, the, the great teachers have taught, let's say, meditation, where you, where you learn how to move in consciousness to the higher uh, realms. So you're here on Earth, but you can tune in. We have this wonderful GPS system, which is also known as the chakras, or the spiritual centers, and those tap you into the collective part of you. But how many of us here on the world meditate? I think most of us are just running around in our little individualized selves. Now, um, I do have to say my field is hypnosis and regression. So I work a lot with putting people into trance and then helping them move into the higher perspective. And a woman came to see me who she said, you know, she had had this very natural, intuitive uh, self. And she was just uh, very gifted when it came to psychic and intuitive ability. But she had been in a car accident. And as she was recovering from the car accident, she found it uh, difficult now to tune in, that something had shifted and she wanted to understand what had happened. So in trance, she quickly went to the place where she said she saw that there were these uh, golden uh, like threads. And she said that what had happened was her body had shifted in a way, she just had to connect to that golden thread in a different way. That it wasn't gone to her, but she just had the, the way that she used to connect to it had shifted because of the, the shift in her body. And so she reconnected to it. But one of the things she said as she was coming back, she got a chance to see others and she said, oh my, hardly anyone is connected to their golden thread. And so I, that always stayed with me. How do we, you know, are we making use of that? I think that golden thread is what connects us to the higher 
realms, the higher consciousness. So I think in this new age, as we're practicing more meditation, you know, part of the new age is that it has, it's a holistic appro uh, uh, approach to God. So it's not, the, God is seen as broader than the religions, and so the new age brings in the concepts that you, know, you can, into Western thought, now we have reincarnation and we have meditation. And Casey said it beautifully that he said, in prayer we talk to God, and in meditation we listen. So it's like a yin-yang. You know, the, the West is the, the talkers of the world, so they did a lot of praying, and the East are the listeners, since so they do a lot of meditating. But I think the New Age is integrating all of these uh, concepts. So I think that the New Age is inviting us into an integration of the individual self and the, uh, and the collective self. Now, um, some of Casey's reading, some of what he said often, sometimes are a little complicated to, to understand. And he said, basically one of the purposes here on earth is to come to know ourselves, to be ourselves, and yet be one with God. To know ourselves and be ourselves and yet be one with God. And I've, over the years of reading Casey's material, kind of wondered what that means, to know ourselves, to be ourselves, and to be one with God or creative forces. Now, um, in one of the accounts of the death of Christ on the cross, there's an eclipse. And we've had a uh, well-known astronomer uh, come to talk about sacred astronomy. And one of the things he has shared with us is he says, when you look at astronomy, you're using math. And you're looking at the calculation of vast uh, spaces, light years, and, and distances that, that are hard to, to conceptualize. What he says is that the, the way that our moon and our sun are experienced here on Earth, he says that that's well beyond chance. Meaning that when you look at the moon, it looks about the same size as the sun. And he says, the distances are incredibly different. That has to be well beyond chance. He says that's why we can have this perfect, you know, these eclipses, perfect solar eclipse. He says, you know, if the moon was just a little bit closer, it would be much larger than the sun. A little bit farther, it would be, you know, the eclipse would be like a little coin, like a, a nickel inside of a quarter. But we have two quarters that come together. And so he says it's a sacred symbol. And what I've taken to interpret that as is that it's the, the alignment of our ego self, which is the, the moon, and the sun, which is our soul self. That our goal is to try to, to align those. And here, that's what I believe he's saying, that to know ourselves, to be ourselves, so to be our individuality, which is, let's say, the moon self, but then to align that self with our higher self, with the God self, that the purpose is, is not just to lose ourselves, and it's not just to know ourselves, but to somehow be both. And again, when Casey would talk about Jesus, he said that one of the misconceptions that's continued about him was that he's always portrayed as this suffering kind of character. And Casey said, no. He said, Jesus, he says, um, his experience towards the cross, he said he was joyous unto the cross. He said they, they almost killed him before they crucified him because he wasn't showing fear. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. It wasn't the passion that you saw with Mel Gibson. Completely different consciousness. And then Jesus liked to uh, have wine every now and then. And he played music that, that he was a fun person to hang around with. So he had an individuality, but he had centered that in the God consciousness. And in my own uh, evolution, I know that I've always enjoyed humor. I've always enjoyed laughing and making people laugh. But as I've developed myself more spiritually, the, the things that I find funny and the jokes that I make have shifted. I mean, when I was younger, I thought it was okay to make somebody else the butt of a joke. And I didn't realize that that was insensitive. And so I, I believe you can have just as much fun without uh, you know, aligning your, your ideals with, with your humor. So here we're, we're invited to this uh, connection. Now, interestingly enough, I'll show you. Ah, this Casey defines as Christianity. I'll show you the Christ consciousness. 
But this is what he says, Christianity. Christianity has come to know yourself, to be yourself, and one with God. Now the term, the Christ consciousness in Christianity, they're, um, they, they're separate, they separate us because we associate Christ with Christianity. And when Casey, when, you're, when he explores that, he puts it in a much, much broader way. So I think if we were to use a word like oneness, because the, the Christ consciousness is the forgotten oneness pattern. If you awaken to oneness, then you're in the Christ consciousness. But people, uh, I was just speaking last weekend in Los Angeles, and a woman who was Jewish came up afterwards, and she said, you know, it was real helpful that you explained that, because I always felt like a, a, a withdrawal from the Casey work because of that Christ-centered language. And so I think it's important to look at what's beneath the language. So when we say this is Christianity, there's nobody's name here. You know, it's not Buddha or Christ. It's just that we come to know ourselves and be ourselves and align those two consciousness. Now, here on Earth, of course, there's a cost. The integrated soul self has a benefit. And then as we separate in consciousness, there's been a cost of souls entering into the earth plane. And I believe that these are some of the costs, that as we've separated from the GPS, from the higher self, that we experience fear, pain, suffering, loneliness, loss of meaning, and disconnection. The child who can't call home, the child who's the prodigal child, just out there in the world, cold and lonely, using up their resources, but, but without the ability to reconnect. So I think that's the, the separation uh, consciousness. And how have souls adapted to that separation consciousness? I would say they have, uh, there's numbing. You know, I think pain for a soul in a physical body becomes a fork in the road. You know, either you go like the Buddhist way, which is life is suffering, but there's a way out of suffering, which is learning how to meditate, or you have so much pain you begin to numb. And that's where addictions come in. And addictions are just numbing because of the pain of being uh, in a physical body. Now, next, I think one of the adaptations is that a result of this numbing or separation is the over-application of karma. It's like on earth, it's almost like karma is the only spiritual law that most people resonate with. You know, karma is just you reap what you sow. And I think that most of us are reaping so much of what we're sowing because we're disconnected from oneness. You know, when you're in the oneness pattern, you know, the, 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 the basically I think of all of us here as a body. And all of us are the different fingers, right? We just, we, we, when you look at it from this, you know, it looks like we're all separate, but the truth is we are all connected. But what happens here on the earth is a group of fingers come and slug you know, the other group of fingers, thinking that they're separate. But it's, if we saw somebody punch in their hand, we would think they're crazy, because that would be the oneness perspective. But here, there's a lot of crazy behavior because people aren't connected to, uh, to that oneness. And so the, the karma, it's because it's, uh, my premise today is that karma is really for slow learners. We're kind of stuck in karmic law, and, you know, reaping what we sow, you know, an eye for an eye. Just we do it and we come back. And, it, you know, karma helps. I mean, there is an evolution in consciousness, but I think that it's almost like it, we're stuck. We're in this repetition of karmic law. I guess they call it being trapped on the wheel of karma. There's plenty of that going on. I think another adaptation is sometimes with suffering, there also becomes dissociation. You know, it's a phenomenon in psychology where, where you just, you know, you just leave your body. You ever had that? You're just kind of like, you know, some of this ADD that we have and this daydreaming. I, I think a dissociation is just kind of daydreaming on steroids. You know, we just kind of just, I'm out of here and you just kind of, as an air sign, I think that, um, you know, when you do your pre-life planning and there's going to be a lot of, of struggle, I think air signs just have an easier time dissociating. Just be the mental, they can just fly away. Whereas water signs, they have a harder time. Water signs are kind of, <laughs> they, they, they're stuck in the feeling. But I, I learned in my life, there was a lot of stress, a lot of change, and I learned how to just kind of float above. But then it was a problem in school, because if I was bored, I'd be floating around the room, had to learn how to integrate that. So I would say that would be a third kind of adaptation to the separation consciousness here on Earth.
So again, I think karma is the slow lane of spiritual development. And so what would be the fast lane? Oh, empathy, empaths. Empathy is the fast lane of spiritual development. Because when you, what, what does empath mean? It means to suffer with. I think that's my next slide where I define it. Empathy means to suffer with. So, so when somebody explains their situation, you can put yourself in their shoes. And before you act, you have a consciousness of how that would feel to somebody else. So you're in the oneness consciousness. Empathy is a spiritual consciousness. It means you and I are one. I'm not going to do something to you that's going to hurt you because that would hurt me. It would hurt me to hurt you. Do you follow that? And there, there you're above karmic law because you're not going to... The karmic law is like you're separated from that someone. I don't care what happens to you. What happens to you has nothing to do with what happens to me. Empathy means if you're hurting, well, I hurt too because I care about you. And I care about everyone. I don't want to hurt anyone. So you could say that empathy is the, the evolution of consciousness from karmic law. Let me go back a slide here. Yes, and I think karma is separation-based consciousness, and empathy is oneness-based. And again, the Christ consciousness is the oneness consciousness. And so as we <laughs> awaken to oneness, we're awakening to our, our wholeness, our spiritual self. Yes, and so when you operate from empathy, you're not breaking a law. You're not breaking spiritual law. The law is love, and empathy is a manifestation of love. Of, of you and you are me. There but for the grace of God go I. And I started off with this uh, concept. The old age led to numbing, which is unhealthy, and sensitivity is actually healthy. And so uh, uh, conferences like this are to start helping shift the consciousness because so many people who are sensitive are blamed for that, are demonized for that. Something's wrong with you because you're sensitive. And we start to believe that ourselves. Something's wrong with me. Nobody else is like me. And I think when you come together as a group, we say, no, there's nothing wrong with you. There's something wrong with the world. You're OK. And it's, you're struggling because you're uh, alone out there. Now, I had a, a, a regression experience myself where I was wondering, have you, do you have like spiritual lights, spiritual friends? But do you find that they live like a thousand miles away? You see them like you know, hardly ever. And what was shown to me is like when you want to light a road, you don't put all the lights in one place. If you want to light a road, you have to put the lights at distances so that the road gets lit. And so that's what's happening to us now. We're like put in different places to light the areas that we're in. And now this is like a light convention. All the, all the road lights are able to come together. Probably, hopefully there's enough <laughs> leftover light that's there as you all are here, just kind of coming to support each other, to, to feed each other, and to gain this sense of um, you're not alone and there's, much, there's a lot right with you. That it's you know that, that you know you can feel this place where there's something wrong with me and you shift that consciousness now. Not that there's something wrong with the world because that's not the, the the mindset to go through, but that you all are pioneers, you're brave souls that are coming in to uh, to pave the way. And so, if you look at like Casey's view of just the history of time from Lemuria to Atlantis to now. You know, if you, any of you been here, uh, been to Egypt? I know there's a tour, is it leaving tomorrow? I guess you guys aren't on that one. <laughs> there's another one, I guess they're sold out. Everybody's going to Egypt now. But you, when you go to Egypt and you go into the Great Pyramid, you know, and you're told that, uh, you know, enslaved people built this place, you know? And then you realize that, that some of these stones weigh, I don't know how many hundreds of tons. And so there's a stone that's in the Great Pyramid that leads into the king's chamber that weighs some massive amount of weight. It's at 17 stories high. How many, it sounds like a joke, how many enslaved people does it take to carry a 100-ton stone 17 floors up? I don't know. That seems like kind of like, um, they must have had different abilities. Then. You see, we're using this mindset that the only way you can lift things is like, is with physical 
ability. There were other ways to do things. But one of the things you can do in a pyramid, and let's say we'll just go with conventional Egyptology. They say that was built about uh, 2,500, maybe uh, 3,000 BC. Okay, so like 5,000 years ago. Casey said it was much older, but even just conventional um, archaeology puts it at 5,000 years ago. Now you can close your eyes and you can rub your hand on the seams of the stone there. There's no, you don't feel a separation of the stone and there's no mortar. The stones are just perfectly placed on top of each other. It's just a, an incredible monument about uh, what this, how this was built and what it was about. But over the years, you know, you go to South America and you look at the ancient sites, also built with massive stones. And as our consciousness has become more and more separate, what do we build with now? These tiny little bricks, <laughs> put one brick, you know, because we're using physical force to build things, whereas we used to be able to interplay between physical and spiritual. And then Casey was talking about Atlantis, and he says, the average person now could not believe, could not fathom the psychic ability of the average Atlantean. The average Atlantean in today's world would be one of the most famous psychics. So that was the consciousness that happened at that time. But we've slowly kind of gotten further and further away from our, our soul selves. And I think in a, you could say, like Casey is saying, we've come as far away as we can. If we go much further, it's not a good thing. And so the plan is, with all of you empaths to come here, this is your uh, rallying. <laughs> Do I hear a seed? Change the world. <laughs> That's what you all are. You're the brave souls that are coming. It's time to shift the, uh, to shift the consciousness. Now, let's look at Edgar Cayce, right? Because this, this, uh, this is the house Edgar built, or Mr. Cayce built. And he was highly sensitive. Now, he was a chain smoker, but his reading said that if he could smoke five cigarettes a day, that that would help him to manage his sensitive nature. That there was something in the nicotine that would just kind of uh, calm him down. I would think that um, in today's language, that uh, Edgar Casey, we, we may have perceived him as being high strung. He was just a little uh, wired, you know, because of his, uh, I mean, Edgar Casey was seeing and perceiving in so many different levels of dimension. Like he said when he'd give a talk like this, the discarnates would show up. And he said they would raise their hands to ask questions. Can you imagine? Yeah, in the robe in the back there. You know, they'd ask a question and he'd answer it. He says, because life is continuous, we're growing. Uh, Hugh Lynn Casey used to say that sometimes they'd go to New York where they would give lots of readings and he said they'd, you know, they had bellhops then, somebody to open the door for you. And they said they'd go into the room, Mr. Casey would look in the room and say, oh, we're getting another room. We don't want to go in this room. So, you know, and, and Hugh Lynn would look around, what the heck's going on in this room? And Edgar wouldn't even tell him. Just say, let's get another room. We don't need to be there. So that's the multidimensional reality that Mr. Casey lived in in the, uh, in the waking state. So somehow cigarettes, now again, disclaimer, this is not, <laughs> those of you who enjoy the sacred plant <laughs> of tobacco, you can't go home to your partner and say, hey, you know what, it's okay to smoke, I gotta have at least five. The problem with Mr. Casey, he could never have five. You know, what happens, if he'd say, well, what happens if you have five and, and it's nine in the morning? <laughs> You know, what am I going to do the rest of the day? So that's how he would get a pack. You know, we have, um, there's like two or three um, film footages of Mr. Casey. Each one of them, his hand is mysteriously behind his back. We don't know why that is. Now, because he's, always, he's hiding his cigarettes. He just was, you know, again, he was from a small town in Kentucky. His family were uh, sharecroppers of tobacco. It just, tobacco was, he was probably smoking when he was 10 or 12 years old, it's just uh, normal. So he developed that habit. And they said he, that that would help uh, uh, ground him. Now I think nowadays that, uh, what can you do to ground yourself? Now when I do trance work, when I take, or I, I shouldn't say I take, when people go to higher levels of consciousness and then come back in this uh, physical self, they're, they're kind of shaky. You know, and now we have something called earthing. You know what earthing is? You, know, you take off your shoes. Have you ever tried that, taking off shoes? <laughs> and then walk on grass or on sand, and then it just, it just helps ground you. So that might be something, uh, this weekend seems like it's gonna be full of practical advice. Uh, maybe most of it you know, but maybe there'll be little things that you can add to your repertoire. But I think spending 
you know, some part maybe of each day, just as much as you meditate, perhaps walking without your shoes outside on grass or sand and just kind of, oh, just grounding yourself from all of this stuff that's going on. As much as, as, much as the human consciousness is loud, the earth, you know, while the earth has its own issues, you know, with, with us, <laughs> it still can ground uh, energy. So that's something to, uh, to consider doing. I think that's what the cigarettes were doing. I think the tobacco was helping to ground Mr. Casey. So finally, here's this pattern. There's a pattern imprinted on the mind awaiting to be awakened by the will of the soul's oneness with God, and sometimes he would say, or with creative forces. When he would give a reading for someone, he would tap in to their uh, beliefs. And so if a person did, was, the word God was toxic, he would use the word creative forces. So there were, he could use them, inter it meant the same thing, but um, you, know, if you, you know, people, you can say it one way. Nowadays, everybody wants to call it source or, or you know, the creator. It's less God's like, <laughs> I use the word oneness. I have yet to see someone say, could you, oh, that oneness word, oh, it burns. <laughs> but I'm sure like, you know, new age children in 20, 30 years, oh, oneness, ah. <laughs> I'll have to, we'll have to find other words. So this is a pattern that Casey says is, is in all of us and needing to be awakened, that means that it's asleep. So you'd have to, in a way, I call it sleeping beauties because the predominant consciousness in the earth is numbed, asleep, dormant. You know, when you're, when you're sleeping, you're in an altered state of consciousness. So most of us are living uh, our life not awakened to our oneness. And I think that empathy, empaths are more awakened to the oneness. And when you're more awakened to the oneness, you feel more and you struggle more. And I think we can all understand why there's been this, this movement into the, into the separation. Now, this is what Casey defined as the Christ consciousness, the, the, the pattern of oneness that in this world is dormant. And so you could say to, um, like if, you, if I was presenting this as a, in a course, you might say, well, that's kind of vague. What does it mean, this pattern imprinted in the mind and waiting to be awakened by the will? Could you give us an example? And here Casey would say, Jesus was a pretty good example. Maybe he would say even Buddha was a pretty, I mean, the word Buddha means awakened. So that may, those would be examples of the awakened consciousness. And I think the empath, empaths are also moving into that awakened consciousness. And you can only imagine what it must have been like uh, for Jesus. You know, for, for Buddha, for being that sensitive. You know, Dolores Cannon, um, wonderful regressionist who passed away a few years, wrote books about um, the different periods in history where people were experiencing through the regressions. And there was this one beautiful story of this um, woman who, um, she was an Essene, according to, uh, G, uh, according to Edgar Cayce, Jesus was an Essene, and this was an Essene woman, and she was a teacher, but she was assigned to teach children. Somehow, you know, there was something called sexism. Is that still around? <laughs> so instead of teaching peers, she was given uh, oversight of children. And she loved doing it, but there was a pain because of how much more there was for her to teach than the children could perceive. And then she had this one encounter where she was with her children that she was teaching, and Jesus had come and he comes to join them, and he telepathically perceives her struggle of this pain of not being fully able to express what she knows. And Jesus expressed empathy. He says, I know how you feel. I too have a lot I would like to teach that you know, the adults aren't ready to hear too. And so she said that was very, you know, sometimes what's great about a group, or even as a psychotherapist when I work with individuals, they'll have a feeling that they're the only one that feels a certain way. And a group is so healing because you realize, oh, I'm not the only one that struggles. I'm not the only one that feels this way. And so that's the benefit of having a group like this. You realize that, oh, okay. Again, it's nothing's wrong with me. This is part of the process of awakening that we've all chosen to go in. And having, being a student of pre-life planning and knowing how this stuff works, you guys are all extremely, extremely brave. You have to, you know, I'll channel your guides for you. But that's what they tell you every night. 
They're in awe of you, tremendous respect of what you're coming in to create. This is not an easy time to pave this way. You know, in the, in the future, when the new age is in its fruition, they're gonna have statues of you. You know, they're like, wow. You know, and you'll be reincarnated and they say, oh my God, you were alive when people used to kill each other? Like, yep, it sure was tough. <laughs> but, but it sounds like a joke, but think of that for a moment. There's people that kill each other right now. There's people somewhere on earth killing each other. There's a war going on and people are killing. I mean, I don't mean to bring down the mood. <laughs> Some of you already feel that. You're like, Peter, we're here to, and I leave here and I feel that stuff here. I'm trying to have another consciousness. But you're here at that time. Imagine being so sensitive. You know, I was talking about watching a movie and how much that hurts to see it in a movie. When you're empathic, it's not a movie. This is what's going on in the world. And then, as like with Edgar Cayce, as an empath, you start to tune into what's going on in people's minds. You know, as a psychotherapist, I hear that when people talk about, you know, the inner voice. And it's not that, un, you know, not that uncommon for me to tell someone after I've heard their inner voice, I'd say, you know, if that inner voice was a person, I'd have them arrested. <laughs> you would never treat anyone the way that you're talking and treating yourself. And so that's what the psychic, the empath, tunes into. And I think that's why empaths have a hard time going into large crowds. You know, it's like, um, it, let, let's say like on, on the, the numbed, you know, the, the, the five sense human, it, they, the comparison would be sound. You know, no person would want to go into a place that had deafening sound. It'd be too loud. I can't go into that mall. It's just too loud in there. But that's the empath's experience. There's a loudness of the, uh, of the suffering or of the, whatever you would call it, just a loudness of the, the abusive patterns or all of these things that, that to the numbed out person, they don't perceive it. The empath is like, whoa. And so that's why I think a lot of empaths don't, they resist that, they stay home and they don't want to go out into the noise of, uh, of the world. And so it's a rough time for empaths. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, Edgar Cayce was one of you, one of us, one of the forerunners. And you know, he did well when he was not well known. Fame is really what killed Edgar Casey. You know, he would have to, he would get a few readings. A uh, when he could give two or three readings a day, he was fine. A book came out. There is a river became a bestseller, and he started getting hundreds of requests for readings. And being the empathic person that he was, difficulty setting boundaries. He started giving 9, 10, 11, 12 readings a day. Now, one of the things that would happen, I think I have it in another slide, is that back then they would deliver the mail to his house. He would get 200 letters a day. And for Edgar Cayce, that wasn't 200 letters. That was 200 people begging for help. So when he would go through the letters, he wasn't picking the first one. He said, we got to get to this one. And you know, he knew which ones were the most urgent. So he couldn't sleep in his own house because these uh, it was just like, could you sleep if you had 200 people a day begging you for your help? You know, they should have put the letter somewhere else, you know, I don't know. But uh, the poor guy, you understand why he was uh, beside himself trying to help. And then also we have to acknowledge that we're moving from the Piscean Age to the Aquarian Age. So the Piscean is a, is a water sign. Jesus epitomizes the Piscean virtues. Edgar Cayce was a Pisces. His son was a Pisces. And so the Pisces, the, the, the detrimental aspect of Pisces is self-sacrifice. Give too much. Give too much and burn themselves out. And as we're moving into the, uh, the Aquarian age, there's the sense of moving into uh, an intellectual. It's a little bit easier. Not, not so much uh, purely heart-centered, but beginning to get uh, the heart and the mind integrated. You know, the, the Aquarian symbol is the water bearer. So they're taking the, the water, the Piscean feeling aspect, and they're applying it through the mind. And so I think that's a, it's a bit of a relief because I think the collective consciousness is moving towards the Aquarian virtues. And I think that in the Aquarian, there's, there's, a, there's potentials for the Aquarian ideal is the love of humanity. And I think that what Casey was talking about is that ages have a subconscious um, effect on people. And so the self-sacrificing element and the emotional element was predominant. 
in the Piscean Age, and it's why Jesus used a lot of the fish metaphor to reach people subconsciously. But I think that as we're moving into the, uh, the Aquarian Age, that there's a different energy that's moving forward. And it's the, it's the potential for the love of humanity, of the true brother and sisterhood of humankind. And that's where there's the potentials for what's spoken of in Revelation, of the, of the period of the thousand years, which just means a period of peace. So that's the goal in this Aquarian age, if we might be able to accomplish a period of time where there's less separation, more of a, of a unity in, uh, in consciousness. And so I would say one of the difficulties in the Piscean and in the empath is setting boundaries. Do you have any problems setting boundaries? Yeah. Some of you are going, what is boundaries? <laughs> or what are boundaries? What is this boundary you speak of? <laughs> So again, just with this theme, uh, maybe I don't need to harp on this, being a rough time for empaths. Some of you know from Casey's work that there was a, a young woman called um, uh, the Little Prophetess, Faith Harding. And so she was becoming well known at the time of Edgar Casey. And so before, they asked for a reading about this girl. And the reading said that she was the reincarnation of Saint Cecilia and the mother of John the Beloved and that she had greater potentials, she had greater abilities than Edgar Cayce. And you can, the uh, archives have some of the readings that she would give. And they're, they sound very much like Edgar Cayce's, but they're, you know, as a little girl, six, seven, eight years old, she's giving these beautiful uh, readings. Now, um, the Cayce's invited her and her parents to come for a reading, I think here in Virginia Beach. And when she arrived, she had a little turban on, and she had, it was written on the side of the car, the little prophetess, and you can imagine she was being used for business. And so when the reading was given for this child, the Archangel Michael spoke through Edgar Cayce. Archangel Michael spoke maybe two or three times. <coughs> Sometimes, most often, not very happy. And so Archangel Michael spoke through Edgar Cayce, and those who were present said his, his timber changed, it was a loud voice, and it was saying, what are you doing? You have a gift coming into the world and you're turning her into a sideshow. You know, get your, you know, then uh, Michael would say, ye sons of men. You know, it's like the, the worst thing, you know, you're, you're, you're sons of the world instead of children of God. You're just acting like, like what is wrong with you? And unfortunately what happened with Faith Harding is that her parents divorced she ended up in a psychiatric hospital. She received electric shock therapy, completely shut down this ability. Beautiful person. She's part of the ARE community. She comes here for uh, conferences. But that ability was, was withdrawn. It just wasn't the right time. And I think that you know, when, when souls are looking into the earth, they're thinking, man, the, the, the wor world needs some help. Yeah, it sure does. Why don't you go in? <laughs> yeah, why don't you go in? I'm not going into that place. And there's some brave souls that they said, send faith. And faith went in and they're all watching and they saw what happened. They're like, nope, <laughs> you see, we're not going in. And so there's been a pause of that. But I think that all of you are coming in with that. And I think that um, in my personal work with um, being here on the earth, the, one of the clearest times I had contact with my guides is they showed me a past life that I had had as a pirate. And I remember thinking that my guides were like shaming. Like, you know, I've got shame, why are they showing me, why aren't they showing me, why aren't they building me up instead of saying, you know, I remember, I remember vividly, they were holding these mirrors and I was there, you know, with my hat and my, my mustache, my Johnny Depp glory, you know. <laughs> it didn't look very good. So I was just like, why are you showing me this? And what they communicated with me is that that I have to accept that, that I have to raise the pirate energy, meaning like what I took it meaning like the recovering addict to be a recovering pirate, yeah. meaning that, that when, you, when you're uh, an early recovery addict wants to relate to somebody who has not judgment and not gonna shame them. So the best person to help an addict is a recovering addict. And so there's that, that uh, sensitivity that's there. And what was being shown to me is that if I accept, if I, if I push the, the, um, the pirate into the shadow, mm, there's enough of that going on. That's where, they're pirates, I'm not a pirate, don't look over here, pirate, pirate, pirates, that's, you know, you know, whatever, put them in jail, kill them all, outside of self. But if you, if you own the pirate and raise it, 
then you can be helpful to uh, the souls that are, that are coming up, that, that need that kind of sensitivity and that sort of thing. So I think that all of you here, it's part of your calling, is that um, you're here to help others with developing their sensitivity. You know, especially with, um, with the male species. Have you met any of them? <laughs> some, some, some select ones are here today. <laughs> some select of the male species. That, that's the, the species that, or the, you know, what I can't be. Okay, I happen to be one. Did you notice? Um, it's that that's the, the, the male is dominant at this time, but the male is also the least, the lesser sensitive. Uh, in, in stereotype, you know, in, in average of the, uh, of the feminine. And so as you're raising children and your grandchildren and their boys, you know, you're not going to tell them this, but just teaching people, you don't tell kids boys don't cry. You don't tell them that. When they have their feelings, you tell them to cherish their feelings, not to numb them out, not to, not to shut them down. And so that's part of this, part of your charges, is that you're bringing in this consciousness and you're seeding it. You're helping it come through for the for future generations. You know, if you have a, an influence on five folks, you know what, five goes to five more. And I think that's slowly how we're working through this uh, evolution in consciousness. And so I, the, the, it's a rough time because the people that I think have been channeling communal thought, they, 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 you know, from 1958 to 1998 was not a good time to be thinking communally. <laughs> it's a good way to get uh, sent back home. When I say that, you know, I've yet to do a regression or hear a past life uh, experience where the person goes, yes, I'm coming back to earth, yeah, I want to, no, there's like, no, <laughs> if you've had one, it's, it's like, don't send me back there. And so I've been, I've been playing on this theme. The influx of empaths is to pave the way for the spiritualization of earth consciousness. But empaths are getting blasted by the noise of silent suffering, the, the, what's behind the numbing. The people that, if someone's numbing, there's a silent suffering that's not getting addressed. And the empath tunes into that. And I think that's where it's a mixed blessing, because that's not good to feel, but you can also help those. As you accept your own pirate, you know, as you accept that you yourself have been in past incarnations, where you understand full well why there's the need uh, for numbing. Okay. Um, yes, repress causes for numbing. I'm, I was thinking, it was, sometimes my mind is on three tracks at once, and I was, I was going to jump tracks, but it'll, it'll come back to me. Now, what are we, uh, what, what are we to do? Now, um, again, the major uh, virus and the major problem that comes with separation consciousness is fear, the fear consciousness. And the fear is the seed experience for almost every illness or every disease that you can think of that. And so we have to be, be cautious of fear. If you, put, if you put fear into the Casey search engine, you just see over and over again examples about what to do when you experience fear. You know, it's like um, sometimes I think that, let's say, if we go outside of the house and it's snowing outside, well, it's not that we don't go outside but we prepare ourselves, we protect ourselves as we go into that consciousness. And so I remember as a boy, I would be afraid of the dark. So if I had to go to the bathroom or something, I would, I would feel the fear. But I had this intuitive sense to pray. And so I started to pray and the fear would subside, the fear would go away. And I've since developed my own prayer that I say often, but I certainly, I say it anytime there's a seed of fear, you know, pick it up early and just get past it. And I think everyone should make their own prayer that's in sync with you know, just calling yourself to that higher consciousness. Mine became just simply, I put the Christ before me, the Christ behind me, the Christ above me, the Christ below me, the Christ to the left of me, the Christ to the right of me, the Christ, Spirit, surround, protect, guide, heal me this day and every day. I just made it up. And I just, for me, the Christ is the oneness. And that by the time I'm uh, done with that prayer, the, the fear has, uh, has subsided. And I guess it's you, you, as you, you know, Casey says very clearly, fear is of the earth. Fear is of the separated consciousness. When you move into the oneness consciousness, like Jesus said, what do you have to fear? You know, the only thing you might have to fear is being separated from God. That's impossible. So have no fear. 
uh, easy to say. <laughs> but, but, you know, Casey always says, why worry when you can pray? And I would say, when you enter into fear, pray. Bring your, bring your consciousness higher. Just knowing that fear means that you're, you're outside without your coat on. And so put your coat on and protect yourself. And, you know, love casteth out fear. That's from Scripture, and Casey quite often times um, repeated that. Now, Casey had a prayer of protection. And basically what his own experience was, um, as you know, eight, Edgar Casey gave 14,306 readings that we have record of. He gave about 1,000 that we don't have record of. So he gave, I'd say, between 15 and 16,000 readings. Eight times in those 15,000 readings, he had a conscious uh, experience of what he was doing when he was transiting to the higher dimensions. And he said it was like going through different neighborhoods. And he said when he would first leave the body, he would go through a very uh, dark, um, scary <laughs> kind of place. And so it was almost like a neighborhood where you want to lock your doors. And so he said that he would see the, the, the beings that were there, and they were distorted in the ways on earth that they had distorted themselves, their energies. And he later re referenced that to the interbetween and the, um, the interbetween and there's another word that he used. Um, but that's the, he called those earthbound souls. So he said that at death, when there's a separation from the soul, from the body, some um, consciousnesses have never raised themselves in an incarnation and they've become addicted, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. And so that they, they linger in this uh, interbetween uh, dimension. And he says that's the first dimension that he would go through. And then he would go through what he described as the suburbs. He said, eh, souls were doing their thing, happy, but neither encouraging nor dissuading. And then he would get to the higher realms where he felt they were encouraging of him on his uh, journey. And so whenever Edgar Cayce would do a transition in consciousness, and he recommended this, Anytime you open yourself, so anytime you're meditating, or anytime you're doing a reading, he just said, as I open myself to the unseen forces that surround the throne within of grace, beauty, and might, I cast about myself that protection found in the thought of the Christ. And when I do my work with uh, praying before sessions, I put the knowledge that I am one with, one with and inseparable from my Creator, because the Christ means the oneness consciousness. So you could say, I surround myself with oneness, but that's what it means. In consciousness, I am one with my Creator, and nothing can separate me from that. And so that's what you, you shore up as you make your transition in consciousness. And then so in that way, you've kind of locked your doors, and there's not going to be intrusions. That Because uh, meditation and prayer, these are opening experiences. And so Casey says, you know, when you open yourself up, surround yourself in prayer. The way I think of it is... Let's say if you're going to have a surgery, right? And the surgeon says, oh, I'll cut you open right now. Would you do that? No, go right here and say, come on, I got a knife. You know, <laughs> slice them open, pull out whatever. No, you wouldn't do that. What does a surgeon do? They have to create, um, uh, what is that called? You know, non germ sterile. They have to create a sterile environment. Yes. And so the surgery happens in this very special environment where they're wearing masks, they've all cleaned themselves. And so they're doing this opening process. Uh, where there's the least opportunity for infection to happen. And when you're doing transition in consciousness, again, you're opening yourself up, you're creating sacred space. And that's what you do in prayer. You surround that place with the consciousness of God, of oneness. And then there's a, a light or there's a protection of the, of the work that you're, you're doing. Now, the other thing that Edgar Cayce talked about and he would do, if you see these pictures of Edgar Cayce giving a reading and he's laying down, he always has his hands over the, sol over the solar plexus. And he was advised to do that. And he said, especially if you ever do meditation laying down, cover the solar plexus. There's less of a need for that when you're, when you're meditating sitting up. But when you lay down, be careful with this area. And it seems that this is an area where there can be energetic uh, intrusion. So it's, have you ever noticed when you're talking to somebody, you just kind of naturally just cover this area up? 
and so you just close yourself off. So that's a good thing to know. You know, there's there's kind of, <laughs> I guess it's a pop. I don't know. I, I, Energy vampires is some of the yeah. word that's used. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, love those people, but don't let them suck your energy away. You know, if you, you, you talk with somebody and you're like, yeah, I'm having such a good day, and you talk with your neighbor, ah, I'm so exhausted. That's, you've been, the energy has been uh, taken from you. So just, just one, one little clue to just cover, cover this area. And that's what Edgar Casey was advised to do in his, uh, it's a, apparently it's an energetic gate of where energies can come in and energies can come out. Now, interestingly enough, when Edgar Cayce would leave his body, he said the silver cord was attached just below the navel. And that's the area where there would be the exiting of the soul and the return. And some of you may know that um, there, was a ch there was an instance where Edgar Cayce was giving a reading. And he had his solar plexus covered. And oftentimes there were people around him and the person who had asked for the reading had written in a letter. And so they passed the letter over his abdomen area. So he's giving the reading and it passes here. <clears throat> he gasped like he had been punched and he lost consciousness for several hours. When he came to consciousness, they saw that this whole area of his body had bruised. And when he was, a few days later, when he was able to give a reading, they said that that's where the silver cord is connected. And it's etheric, but it starts to become physical as it gets closer to the body. And that paper had hit it. And it said if it had severed, he would have died. He was at risk that he could have cut his, uh, that cord. He wouldn't have been able to reenter the body. So um, Gertrude Casey, who would conduct the readings, you know, she, <laughs> she had quite a job. And don't pass anything over my <laughs> husband. And, and she also felt that, she, that at some point, especially when he was pushing himself too hard, that she felt that he was going to die on the, on the chair. Because he, he would lose consciousness sometimes when he was pushing himself uh, too hard. And he wouldn't listen to her. He would say, well, if you're not going to conduct the readings, I'll, uh, I'll find someone who will do it. So that was his ideal, though. You know, as we look at Edgar Cayce, his ideal was you know, the, he was following in the footsteps of the one who gave his life for his friends. So when, when you want to be like, that's your ideal, what did Edgar Cayce do? He also gave his life for his friends. But if you look at the readings that he was giving, the readings said, slow down. You can live to be 100 if you take better care of yourself. But he didn't. It was his personal ideal. So the, the readings were, in a way, saying you'll, you'll help a lot more people if you pace yourself. But again, I think his Piscean self-sacrificing ideals were overriding the good wisdom. But I think some of what we can take as we move forward into the Aquarian age is to pace ourselves, have balance, you know, serve. And it's not selfish to take care. Self-care is not selfish. You have to take time to replenish your energies. You just can't. This world is a draining place. This world will suck it out of you. So you have to take time to, you know, some of you know that. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. Yes, and so I covered this. So we have to navigate the body and its needs and the soul and service and its needs. We can't, you can't, the, the boundaries, you just can't lose yourself in the fusion of serving others. In the oneness, you have to realize that you are also an individual. That you have to, you have to realize that you are in a body. And of course, when you're serving others, you forget that you're in a body. Have you ever had that? You're serving, you're serting, you're serving, you're serving, and then it's the end of the day, and you come back to your body, like, you, you feel that? It's just like you've over-served. It happens to me when I, uh, when I talk here. You know, it doesn't matter what's happened before. I come up here and I'm like, you know, I'm getting this energy. And then the moment the curtain drops, I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> time to go to bed. <laughs> but it's good to just keep that in, in, uh, in mind. And I think Edgar Cayce had his wife who was helping him with that. Now, in, in one of his readings, he was told, you know, she almost died from tuberculosis. And the reading said, if she wasn't with Edgar Casey, she would have died much younger because of the tuberculosis. But it also said, Mr. Casey would have died much younger if it wasn't for her. Like all of this, it would seem like nagging was helpful. He would hear her and he would, uh, he would slow down with her, with her feedback. But let's learn from the Casey example rather than emulate it. I mean, emulate it in its ideals, but not the, not the over-service. I think that when you come here to Virginia Beach, you get sucked into that. You know, I'm having to fight with the, the draw t 
towards over-serving and kind of balancing service with, uh, with self-care. Now, I talk about that a lot. It's a mantra. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care means getting something called sleep. Anybody heard of that? <laughs> getting something called sleep. You know, eating healthy foods. Getting outside sometimes. Spending time in silence. Now, there may be people in your life that are going to call that selfish. And your clients are going to be ringing your phone off the hook. There's times where you just have to not take the calls and have to build into your schedule. You know, in a, with my work, what I've gotten is that for every hour that I spend working, I have to spend an hour not working. So for every day I work, I have to take a day off. And so, so heed that. You, know, you, you have your own inner guidance. And if you listen to it, it'll, it'll tell you. Like, just like Edgar Cayce, he got the, the good advice that wasn't listened to. But learn from that. Try to get the good advice that you actually listen to. And then your, your service will be much broader. It won't, like in, in a day, you won't serve as many people, but in a lifetime, you'll serve many more. So you have to go into that higher perspective, which the Aquarian uh, age offers you. You can tune in to saying, okay, in the short run, I'm taking a day off, but in the long run, I'll be able to help more people that way. So I'm going to review uh, some of the ideas that I've brought up, um, that karma is for slow learners. We're stuck in a karma-based world. And it's just uh, going over and over. The empath, empathy is for fast learners. It's a fast track. And I think we're here to teach people how to find their way home and to develop more empathy. Move from karma to empathy. Are you, another word would be grace. Empathy is one of the, the gracious uh, attitudes, or empathy is part of the law of grace. We're in the process of reclaiming our wholeness. Again, numbing is not healthy. Numbing is the predominant. The, the, the world thinks that numbing is healthy. Pull yourself off by the bootstraps. Buck up, buttercup. These kind of, that's the thought of rugged individualism. But listen to Brene Brown. Vulnerability is strength. Being vulnerable. Actually taking off the armor. Of course, you have to do that in the right places. You can't take off your armor in a battlefield. But surround yourself with people that you can feel safe enough to do that. Now, I hope this weekend they talk to you about the Search for God groups. I think a Search for God group, you know, you could, it doesn't have to, it could be any kind of, well, I don't know if it could be any kind of group, but the Search for God groups are, it's uh, two books with 12 chapters, and I call it a recovery program for being human. It helps you recover your spiritual self. It's just these 12 uh, principles that you work with as a group. Meditation is in there. Uh, working with ideals is in there. And as you work with that in a group, you just get a sense. Like, like my Search for God group that I was in in Boston was, was foundational. It was just, it really helped me get grounded in a community and in these values. Um, so that's something that you might think about as you reclaim your wholeness, realizing numbing isn't healthy, uh, sensitivity is healthy, Getting support is healthy. Being around people that validate you who, for you who you are because the world is going to denigrate you. The world is going to say, you're too sensitive. Any of you heard that? Yeah. 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 It's just, it hurts, doesn't it? You're told you're too sensitive and then you try to, try to become insensitive. And an empath is a big failure at being insensitive. Right? You've tried it, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, so accept who you are. I think I've said that enough times. <laughs> So it's hug an empath. <laughs> Again, but ask for permission first, accept no for an answer, but don't guilt them and, and don't, okay, second, I don't even, don't just leave them alone. <laughs> and so what you can do, I think you're gonna get lots of advice on how to practice self-care and, and be a, a healthy empath, but I advise you to pray, Spend time in silence and meditation. Spend time in nature. Set boundaries. You know, no is a complete sentence. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you might want to do, what I find is healthy or helpful, is that I have somebody uh, manage clients. So, because if somebody reaches me, all they have to do is, I really want to meet with you. And, okay, I'll see you tomorrow at 4 a.m. It's the only <laughs> opening I have, right? And it, 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 hearing from the person, I can't set the boundary. But if you, if you just have like, Somebody said, oh, I need to see Mr. Weber. He's, you, know, you, you can see him in May. I need to see him right away. May. Uh, okay, May. You need, a, you need a lion at the gate to kind of protect you from all that stuff. 
<clears throat> setting boundaries. It's good. Learn how to set boundaries. It's, it's going to be hard at first. You're going to feel so bad, but you're going to feel worse if you don't set boundaries. So realize that, that boundaries is, the, is the, the, the lesser of the two evils. Just kind of work with that. And at some point, you might get used to it. Acknowledge the flesh suit. You know, your flesh suit, your, your soul is in this little vehicle right now. So acknowledge that it has needs. What are the needs of the body? What does it need? It needs water. <laughs> it needs food. It needs sleep. It needs relaxation. You can't, you know, in case you had a reading where he says, you fool yourself if you don't balance your life. What happens if you, if you just give and give and give and give? You get sick. You get some kind of illness because you're living out of balance. So oftentimes sickness or illness is an out of balance uh, nature of an of a individual. When you read these books, people that have gotten cancer will say, oh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. When I was younger, I said, well, how could that be the best thing that ever happened? Because it forced them to learn balance. Sometimes people have to be at death's door before they say, oh, yeah, maybe there's a different way. Maybe I try something uh, different. And then cover your solar plexus. <laughs> now, don't take, don't take it personal this weekend if you're talking to somebody and they go like this. They're like, I'm not sucking your energy. I I'm going to do it more. And they're like, no, I just, I just scratched my stomach. <laughs> God, I'm not talking to you. So, so people do that. Just, they're just practicing. Don't take it personal. They just want to see how it goes. And I think that's... Oh. <laughs> there, oh, here it is. We're breaking ground. And here's a reading from Casey. Be glad you have the opportunity to be alive at this time, to be part of the preparation for the coming influences of a spiritual nature that must rule the world. These are indicated and these are part of that experience. Be happy for it and give thanks daily for it. And so I'll end the talk on that note that uh, there's our, there are countless souls that would want to be alive at this time. This is a very pivotal uh, moment in, in soul human history. And those other souls aren't here because you all are the chosen ones. You all have the, uh, are the hope for this uh, transition. So as much as it's draining in the world, realize that you have uh, enlisted yourself. You weren't forced here. You chose to come in to be part of a very important and a very, very difficult work that needs to happen. And I hope that even in your meditations, you get some of that feeling. Like I remember when I was with my guides, they were so reverential. You know, I thought seeing my guides was gonna be like, you know, Come in here, Peter. Do you remember anything that you planned? You know, I thought it would be like going to the principal's office. It wasn't. Your guides, they know how difficult this world is. They know what you've signed up for. And things here, uh, you know, if you can get one spiritual thing done a month, they're like, whoa, you did it. You know, you feel like, God, I only did one thing. <laughs> like, most people aren't even doing one in a lifetime. You're doing one a month. So I hope you take some of that with you, that uh, honor yourself. That, you're, you have, you're a, I mean, this sounds a little corny, but in a way you're a hero. On the other side, you're thought of as a hero, that you've volunteered to come in uh, to be part of this very important, very uh, difficult time. God. So thank you. Feel free to applaud like crazy now. Ah, oh, too kind. Oh. There goes my connection, my ego is now.